Okay, it seems like those of um, attendees that uh, joining us have sort of tapered off. So um, I'm very pleased to um, introduce our speakers today. My name is Jen Cassell. I am the um, synthesis coordinator at the LNO. And um, today we are really pleased to have two speakers. First, though, I think I'll do a little bit of um, housekeeping here before. I introduce our speakers. I actually see people still rolling in. So you all are attendees, you're on mute. Um, we can unmute you uh, if we need to, but we prefer that everybody ask questions of our speakers using the Q&A button, which should be somewhere down on the bottom of your Zoom screen. And there you can type your question and you, can, um, you have the feature of doing that with your name or you can do it anonymously. And if um, folks like that question, you actually can upvote it by pressing on the little raised thumb. And um, if you were gonna ask the same question, you don't have to type it again, you can just upvote it. And we'll, um, we'll, we'll get all those questions to our speakers at the end um, of their presentation. And um, I wanna let everyone know as well, we are recording this and all of um, our, our, some, our webinars are posted on the uh, LTER YouTube channel, and the URL is on the bottom of this screen that you're looking at right now. Um, if at the end there's time and you really want to verbally say your question, you can raise your hand, um, and we'll try to attend to that, and we can unmute you, but we can't promise that, um, that we can find the raised hands uh, among all of you attending today. So try to use the Q&A if you can. Um, if you have any technical issues, you can also um, throw them in the chat. We'll try to help you with that. So with that, I am super pleased to um, introduce our two speakers today. We have Kathy Jo Jankowski and Joanna Carey. Kathy Jo is a, a research ecologist at the U.S. Geological Survey, and she's the PI for a long-term water quality monitoring component of um, the Upper Mississippi River Restoration Program. Um, and her research is broadly focused on how land use and climate change impact um, ecosystems. And um, with her as a co-PI on this synthesis working group is Joanna Carey. Joanna is an assistant press professor at Babson College. She's a biogeochemist and an ecosystems ecologist. And her research is, is again, broadly focused on understanding ecosystem processes in the context of rapid global change. Um, she explores how human activities are altering carbon, nitrogen, and silicon cycling along land-sea continuum and has worked in forests, rivers, salt marshes, estuaries, um, as well as both temperate and arctic systems. Um, and uh, together, these are the, the co-PIs for a working group entitled From Poles to Tropics, Multibiome Synthesis Investigating the Controls on River Silica Exports. And that's what they'll be talking to us today about. So. I will turn it over to um, to you, to our first. Uh... Great, thank you so much, Jen. It's a pleasure to be here. So I'm gonna share my screen. Please let me know if you can't see my screen, but you should be able to. So on this uh, front page, that I'm showing you here, I have my name and uh, co-PI Kathy Jo, uh, who was just introduced, and we have the other members of our working group who've contributed significantly to the data and the analysis we're going to show today. So I want to give them, them credit right now before we get going. Also, before we jump in here, I just want to make a little note about terminology. So you'll likely hear both myself and Kathy Jo say Silica and silicon, we'll probably use those words interchangeably. Uh, silicon is the element in the natural world. It's bound with uh, several oxygen atoms, so silica. So we use them interchangeably, but hopefully that won't confuse you. So today we're gonna talk about our synthesis, looking at river dissolved silica exports at the global scale across multiple biomes. And you might be wondering, you know, why study silica? There's a lot of emphasis on you know, other elemental cycles that are perturbed and are interesting in the global context of change that we're interested in. But silica is, is often, I feel, underappreciated. So I'm gonna talk a little bit now about why we're studying it in the first place. And there's many reasons to study this element. 
most of our motivation is driven by diatoms. And you may know diatoms are ubiquitous autotrophs in both freshwater and marine environments. And in the ocean, diatoms account for roughly 50% of net primary production. So they're really important for the global carbon cycle and sucking up CO2. And unlike other types of phytoplankton, diatoms have high silicon requirements. On a molar basis, they require as much silicon as nitrogen. And so at, while they're taking up a lot of CO2, they're also taking up a lot of dissolved silica in the ocean. And diatoms not only take up a lot of carbon, but they also are the base of aquatic food webs. And so their presence has implications for higher trophic levels. And compared to other types of phytoplankton, there's evidence that indicates that diatoms are more nutritious food for higher trophic levels and their presence is important for that reason. And not only do diatoms suck up a lot of CO2 through primary production, but they're also efficient at exporting that carbon to the deep ocean. And roughly 40% of the carbon sequestered in the ocean is attributed to diatoms because diatoms are relatively heavy compared to other types of phytoplankton. So, you know, organisms that eat the diatoms, their fecal material often will sink faster. So we care about, silica for those reasons. And some of you on this call are probably thinking, well, there's other marine organisms, uh, other aquatic organisms that sequester silica. And that's absolutely true. Diatoms are definitely not the only silicious marine organisms. There's radiolarins and sponges and picoplankton, another autotroph, have been found to have very high silica content, uh, sometimes rivaling that of diatoms, although it ranges widely. So many reasons to care about silica in marine systems. And what happens if there's not enough silica in marine coastal, in coastal waters relative to other nutrients is that you can have a shift in the phytoplankton community assemblage. And what happens if you have say more nitrogen and phosphorus compared to silicon is that the diatoms will bloom, use up the silica, and then there's not any more there, but then another type of autotroph will then take over. And that can be a dinoflagellate and it can be in some cases associated with harmful algae blooms, these shifts in the stoichiometry that, that, deter, that result in altered uh, phytoplankton community. And so we know, we have very good evidence that this, this occurs when you have, you have altered stoichiometry in some coastal systems that results in shifts in coastal autotrophic communities. And this happens because, as you, you may know, humans have increased the amount of nitrogen and phosphorus going into our aquatic receiving waters through human activities such as urbanization and agriculture. Those activities often put more nitrogen and phosphorus into aquatic systems compared to silica. And at the same time, we also are damming rivers all over the globe. And this process of damming rivers, sometimes known as the artificial lake effect, has the ability to sequester the silica in greater proportions of nitrogen and phosphorus. Basically, when you slow down water, you can induce a diatom bloom, then that silica sinks and is regenerated slower than nitrogen and phosphorus, leading to silica limitation downstream of dams. This process has been well documented, and these shifts in stoichiometry, as I mentioned earlier, can lead to shifts in the phytoplankton community assemblage. And so this has been well, well documented, but we are, have wondered, the silica community, research community, you know, are there other ways that humans are altering the global silica cycle? And the answer is yes. And we'll talk, I'll talk a little bit about that in a, in a few moments. And so if we're thinking about how, are, how have humans altered the global silica cycle, an important place for us to do our research is looking at river systems. So I focus a lot on marine silica cycle, but we, we have to look upstream a little bit to understand how humans are impacting the silica cycle. And that is because rivers supply over 80% of the dissolved silica inputs, the annual inputs into the ocean every year. Over 80% of those come from river systems. And so you know, river systems transport large quantities of material from terrestrial to marine waters, and that's certainly the case for silica. So when we're trying to understand human perturbation of the global silica cycle, rivers are an important place to investigate. And so the, the, one of the goals of this project is to look at the controls on river silica across biomes. And so I'm just gonna give a little bit of background about what we know already on the controls on river silica exports. So silica, SiO2, is the most abundant element in the Earth's crust. 
And that means that weathering rates, particularly chemical weathering, exerts large control over the flux of silica from land to sea. And in turn, geochemical and hydrologic factors play a large role in determining the flux of silica from land to sea. So that would be factors like lithology type, but also basin slope, runoff, um, and, and climate temperature, for example. Also hydrologic factors like stream flow are an important control on the flux of, of rivers for sure. And then once the silica makes its way into a river system from the rock, it's weathered, goes into soil solution into the river system, you have processes along the river continuum that control the export. And in-stream processes, both in river and in lakes, can determine freshwater diatom blooms because diatoms don't just bloom in marine systems, they are ubiquitous in freshwater systems. So factors that influence primary production in freshwater can also determine the amount of dissolved silica exported to the oceans. So factors like light, nutrients, residence time, remember the issue with the artificial lake effect of dams, so if you alter the residence time of water, that determines that flux as well in some cases. And finally, another factor that determines the amount of silica exported from land to sea are land plants. And I have that highlighted here because it's often overlooked and not as well known among the scientific community, the important role of land plants in the global silica cycle. So we have silica being mobilized from the rocks into aquatic systems, making their way downstream to the ocean, but that pathway is not direct. Along that pathway, there's processes that happen in stream, but also on land, because land plants take up that silica um, along the land ocean continuum. So I'm just gonna spend a little bit of time talking a little bit about land plants and silica because it's less well understood and vegetation cover can exert important controls over the flux of silica from land to sea. So just like diatoms in the ocean, terrestrial plants take up dissolved silica. They take it up through their roots and transport it through their xylem as they move water. They move the dissolved silica that's in the soil solution, typically. And they often deposit it at plant um, transpiration termini, like the leaves. So the, the water leaves the plant, but the silica has no gaseous phase. It stays in the plant, gets more and more concentrated, and becomes these hard, siliceous bodies known as phytoliths. There's dynamic ranges of silica in land plants. Actually, the, the amount of silica in land plants ranges more than any other element. Um, and it provides numerous benefits, mostly from the stress to these plants. So the, the silica that plants take up becomes biogenic silica, just like the silica in, in diatoms. And that biogenic silica on the landscape is orders of magnitude more bioavailable than mineral silicates because the biogenic silica in plants dissolves order of magnitudes faster. So the plant silica can never by be an important source of silica in terrestrial systems and can be uh, a source of the silica exported in rivers. And the amount of silica taken up by land plants is a globally important flux. Uh, you know, to put it in comparison, uh, we estimate that the amount of silica in land plants is roughly 60 to teramoles of silica taken up each year. Compare that to diatoms in the ocean, which is roughly 240 teramoles per year. So this is a globally important flux. Okay, so there's some background on controls on global uh, river silica exports. And just a little bit more about the land cover. There really is no consensus yet on the role of land cover in controlling the flux. Certain types of land cover have been shown to be associated with more fluxes. Same type of land cover sometimes is associated with reduced fluxes. And so the reason for this is that there's, there's multiple processes going on here. Land plants, they can stimulate rock weathering. Plant exudates uh, produce a CO2, which is an acid that can stimulate weathering. So sometimes plant presence is associated with more exports from landscapes. As I mentioned, plant dissolution, that plant BSI is really bioavailable. So using silicon isotopes and uh, germanium silicon ratios, we can trace the source of the dissolved silica exported in rivers. And some many studies have shown that a lot of the silica exported in rivers has gone through that plant pathway before it's reached the river itself. And then plants take up silica, retain it on the, on the landscape, sometimes reducing that flux to the sea. And then there's agricultural activities you know, continual plant harvest of silica rich crops deplete soils of biogenic silica, and that can reduce fluxes. 
and vegetation management. If you clear cut a forest, do you take that vegetation completely away from the watershed or do you leave it there to decompose? That activity has shown to show up in the signal of river silica exports and streams. And finally, urbanization can cause increased silica exports in, depending on the source of drinking water and the wastewater effluent uh, practices. So there's varying controls on, on land cover and it appears from the literature that it's regionally variable. So we're still trying to work through that as a global community. What is the role of land cover? So I've talked about the perturbations that we know about the silica cycle, altered stoichiometry, damming up of rivers, and I've talked about the controls on river silica exports uh, so that we know of. And so one of our research questions, actually the research question we're talking about during today's talk, is looking at another type of human perturbation of the silica cycle, and that's climate change. So we have many reasons to think that warming might be altering silica exports in rivers. Warming, it would be associated with, or is associated with higher weathering rates, higher chemical weathering rates. Also with climate change, we're seeing changes in runoff rates, in stream flow. We're seeing shifts in hydrologic flow paths. For example, as you have permafrost thaw, you have more water rock, water rock interaction times. This we, would, we think would lead to higher uh, fluxes and some studies have shown that. Then there's shifts in phenology associated with climate change, changing in the timing of ice out, shifts in the biological activity of in-stream and terrestrial uh, um, uh, organisms. And then there's shifts in vegetation cover associated with climate change. For example, you know, northern migration of tree line or shrub encroachment on certain areas or is just one example. So all given the background I just showed you, you can see how these changes related to climate change have the ability, we think, to alter silica exports. So the overarching objective for our synthesis is to investigate the controls on the magnitude and the seasonality of river silica exports especially how they relate, how they change over biome type and how they differ across river trophic state. So just digging into that a little bit more, we have three specific research questions we're looking at for, through this study. And one of them is getting a better handle on the role of terrestrial vegetation in controlling that flux and, and especially how that varies across biome type. We also will are wondering about how river trophic state influences silica exports. So I spoke a lot at the beginning about altered stoichiometry and what that does, how that can lead to silica limitation and shifts in phytoplankton community assemblage. And we have a really good handle on that in marine coastal systems and in some lake systems, but I, that question deserves more attention in river systems themselves, how that varies across biome type and how that varies with river trophic state. And then finally, our last question that we're getting at with this research is how it has climate change altered silica exports um, and not just the exports, but the seasonality and the concentrations. And this is in fact, what we'll be talking about today. So we, we went right for question three first with, with this research proposal. Once we got it funded, we dove right into question three. So just a little bit of background on our study design. So we, to investigate this question, we clearly needed data from multiple biomes. And so, oh, there's a little problem with the slide, but these are different biomes. The images aren't, the text boxes are gone, but basically we have data from Antarctic sites, which would be the no terrestrial end member. So Antarctica, does, the sites at McMurdo don't have terrestrial vegetation. So we have this no terrestrial end member. And then we have sites uh, in tropical, temperate, alpine uh, uh, ecosystems and uh, the Arctic as well. And here is a map on the, the top panel that shows you the the LTERs that are included in the synthesis plus other networks, other um, data that we've included. So you can see 18 dots on the top map. And so we don't have just 18 sites that we have sort of 18, let's call them LTERs, although they're not all LTERs. And in fact, we have over 400 individual stream sites included in this data set that we've compiled, which is pretty awesome. And these sites run the gamut of climate. So you can see on the second part of this graph on the bottom part, 
precipitation and temperature that these you can see where these sites fall as a function of precipitation and temperature and so we have very cold very warm very wet very dry sites so that's exciting for answering our research questions so the research question we're going to be talking about today is you know how has climate change influenced silica exports and the seasonality and the concentrations across biome type and what do we know so far well we very few studies have really investigated this question. We do know some data from the Arctic, the Siberian Arctic, that permafrost thaw seems to be associated with increased silica exports in small streams. Uh, and we also have, know from a long term experimental warming study at Harvard Forest that it, warming seems to speed up internal rates of silica cycling within the forest and cells, but that study didn't look at exports at all. So we have a, you know, there's a big call here to look at this. And so that's what we're, we'll be working on today, telling, showing you that data. So our hypothesis, our hypotheses is that we're going to see, and again, the little text boxes on top of the biomes aren't there, but you get the, maybe you can get the idea here that we expected to see different signals of change depending on biome type. And we thought in the cryosphere sites like the Alpine, the Antarctic and Arctic, we'd see increasing silica exports, mostly due to permafrost thaw. And then we thought in temperate systems, we'd see declining exports because we thought there's a longer growing season. So there might be more terrestrial productivity taking up that silica uh, is one reason. And there's more nutrient availability and that might stimulate uptake of silica in temperate systems. And then we expected the tropical sites to show the more most excuse me, to show the most muted response because it's already warm and those soils are heavily weathered. Um, and so this is what we came into the study expecting to see. And as Kathy Jo will show you, we see some differences than, than this, which is interesting and exciting. So Kathy Jo is gonna take over now. So I'm gonna stop sharing and she's gonna start sharing. Great, um, thanks, Joanna. Hopefully you are seeing this. We look good? Okay, well, um, yeah. So um, what I'll focus on is what we've, um, where we've gotten to so far with our third question, thinking about long-term change in concentration fluxes and then the seasonality of silica concentrations and exports. Um, so as, Joanna mentioned, um, we pulled data from several biomes. Um, for this analysis, we specifically um, are able to cover 11 long-term research sites um, that represented eight, eight different biomes. So this is a, a modified map from what Joanna just showed. Um, and these data are pulled primarily from um, the LTER network. Um, there's some sites from USGS, um, mostly in the upper Mississippi River, um, a few from the CZO, um, network as well as um, um, large Arctic river sites from the Great Rivers Observatory. Um, and as Joanna mentioned, we our data set includes over 400 sites. Um, and but in screening for this analysis, um, because of the particular um, analytical approach we wanted to use for this, um, we ended up with um, 60 rivers um, that had sufficient long-term data. Um, so that meant that they had um, a 20-year record of concentration that included multiple observations per year, as well as um, daily discharge at the at some site that was nearby. Um, this um, gave us about three, um, from three to 20 different streams or rivers per biome. Um, and those timescales, we have one site that we included that's 15 years, um, otherwise um, from 20 years to 54 years um, from the Hubbard Brooks system. Um, and finally, these sites range quite a bit in their drainage area. So we have, you know, headwater streams from the Luquillo LTR in Puerto Rico, as well as um, some tiny streams from McMurdo in the Antarctic, all the way up to um, the Mississippi River, and then these several large um, Arctic river sites. Um, so to get at the first question of how have concentration and fluxes changed over time, um, I won't go too deep into this. Um, probably several of you are familiar with this approach, um, but we, um, one of the way we, uh, in, when you're thinking about synthesizing across disparate data sets, one of the issues you face is that they're not all collected over the same spatial extent or temporal scales. Um, so it can be difficult, difficult um, to put them together um, since they were not all collected with the same purpose in mind. Um, so what we 
um, did to get around this was use this um, sort of flexible modding approach um, that um, was able to, didn't need the same sampling frequency, but was able to use um, our daily discharge values to um, generate daily values of concentration and flux. Um, and so this is the weighted regressions on time, discharge, and season model um, that we applied in this case. Um, there has several advantages um, over other flux models. You don't assume this constant concentration discharge relationship over the period of record seasons or across discharge values. And it doesn't assume that that's linear. Um, the other major advantage in which I'll rely heavily on in this talk um, is that it generates these flow normalized concentrations. Um, so one thing that um, most of you well know is that concentration is highly sensitive to changes in discharge. Um, and so this is really um, designed to eliminate the effects of year-to-year -year variability in discharge on uh, the trend in water quality. So you could end up with a time series that has a really high um, discharge year at the beginning or end, which could obscure um, the trend that you're seeing through time. So it's essentially um, and really a lot more complicated. Um, so if you're interested in more of the details of the method, but it's essentially looking at the change in concentration over some average discharge value through time. So you generate a smoothed value. Um, and it also helps um, to isolate what is um, the effect of what is happening on the landscape from um, sort of these random fluctuations in discharge from the year. Um, it, uh, because of all this amaz amazing information it generates, it actually has a lot of high hefty data requirements, as I mentioned, daily discharge, um, recommended 20 years of data and um, several samples per year. Um, so what I rely on for this, um, we generated daily concentrations and fluxes at all of these sites. Um, we also generated a daily flow normalized concentration and flux. We could then summarize those in a variety of ways. Uh, monthly, annually, um, however we want seasonally. Um, and what I'm showing you is just the way that that model, one of the, our example output from the um, estimated concentrations in the line and then our observed um, measured values um, are the points. And to estimate annual trends, um, we did it for all these different output metrics, including discharge. Um, but what I'm going to focus on today are these trends in flow normalized concentrations and fluxes. Um, so we also used non-parametric trend test um, to look at those. And a lot of what I'll talk about today is the percent change. So um, the egret uh, package, which is part of the modeling package, um, generates uh, a metric of change. And we convert that into percent um, because a lot of our sites vary widely in their concentrations. Um, so it put, kind of puts them on the same scale. And then we can also look at cross compare the magnitude of change with um, the change in flux. So finally, some results <laughs> we can show you. Um, so uh, what I'm showing you here um, are all of our um, streams in this long-term analysis and they're sorted by their biome type. Um, and this is showing the percent change in flow normalized concentration, um, the plot for flux or export looks really similar to this one. Um, and so a few um, you know, top line messages from this um, right off the bat. First, you can see that there's highly variable trends across these different sites, um, you know, even across biomes and then within biomes, we're seeing a lot of variability. Um, and a lot of these trends aren't necessarily what we were expecting. Um, we did see that the most substantial change was occurring in a lot of these cryosphere sites, like Joanna mentioned. So seeing really big changes um, at the, in the Alpine sites, which is um, at the Niwot, uh, at the yeah, Niwot uh, LTR. Um, and then a pretty substantial increase as well at um, the Arctic site. And that and that's um, one of the streams um, at the Tulik LTR. Um, we only were able to run one, but um, this is representative of um, the other trends we're seeing at that site, but also seeing the increase there, um, which is, is what we expected, sort of given um, increased opportunities for, um, for weathering to occur as glaciers melt at the Alpine site, and then as you get some permafrost thaw at, um, in Tulik. Um, some of the surprising um, results, though, we saw were um, sort of if you think at another part of the Arctic, we have all these large river sites that sort of span um, span the polar Arctic region. And we, across all those river sites, we saw um, uniform declines in silica over their period of record. So the last 20 years or so at those sites, um, which was a, was a sur very surprising result. was not at all um, what we had anticipated there. And it's, and it's really interesting that it's um, sort of this uniform signal um, that's happening there. So we're still trying to understand exactly why that's occurring. Um, but we're also seeing, uh, we saw generally saw declines in these small Antarctic streams, which is 
not necessarily what we were expecting. We're thinking of increased weathering and more silica fluxes, um, but instead this might, it appears to be a signal of um, potentially changing river productivity or um, shifts in, uh, in river flow dynamics and hyperreic weathering. Um, and just to finish up this slide, I think in terms of our expectations, um, the temperate coniferous forest sites and tropical rainforest sites met our expectations of small magnitudes of changes. Um, and then we were, for the other three biomes, we're just seeing a lot of variation, especially we have the most sites in the temperate deciduous forest, but just a lot of variability within those, as well as at temperate grassland, and then um, a little bit of variability in our tropical savanna sites at the Kissimmee River. I mean, to give you a sense of what that looks like, so we see, you know, variability among streams within these different sites. Um, this is showing you again, um, and I apologize if I'm pronouncing this incorrectly, but from the Newat Ridge LTER, um, these are our three sites from there that range in their um, mean watershed elevation. Um, and you can see they're all increasing um, over their period of record, but um, this most, this really substantial increase in concentration um, at this the highest elevation site at Saddle Stream um, is pretty impressive. And um, that site is just downstream of um, some glaciers. And so, you know, really um, appears to be a lot of change happening at that site. And then with another basins, um, like the basin I work in primarily on the upper Mississippi River, um, these sites are all main stem sites along that uh, within the basin, and we're actually seeing opposite trends in the northern portions of the basin than we are seeing in the southern portion. So these darker blue ones here and this green one, um, we're seeing increasing concentrations and fluxes in the northern sites, um, but then de decreasing as we get further south um, into the basin, into Illinois and Missouri. Uh, so some really interesting different signals even within um, one river system. Um, just to show you, um, changes in flux generally matched um, the changes in concentration. So in terms of the percent with change in concentration and percent change in flux, they fell mostly along this, nicely along this one-to-one -one line with um, some, some divergence, particularly in um, uh, these alpine sites. Um, and in general, we had larger concentration changes and we had flux changes. So more of these points are falling um, on this side of the line, um, suggesting that um, more of these changes are potentially occurring at low flow rather than high flow, given that, um, that uh, they're both flow normalized values. Um, and uh, one really interesting, uh, slightly different story that we found is when you convert these into area normalized fluxes, um, we um, see a slightly different story. So we're seeing, you know, really, um, these really large changes occurring at this alpine site, as you could see from these previous plots I've showed you. Um, but then the, in this, when we convert it to this metric, um, these tropical rainforest sites really pop out. Um, and we think that is really a function of the, that they're, um, they have really high concentrations, they're gaining um, silicate geology, so have some of the highest concentrations in our data set, um, but they also are the smallest watersheds. So per unit watershed area with these high concentrations, these tiny changes could make um, a really big difference in these headwater streams and have important implications for the, for the silica cycle. Um, yeah, just to, I think, yeah, we can come back around to this. Um, but I, I, in, in terms of putting these in context, you know, these, um, these major changes we're seeing at, uh, in alpine sites and the Keo um, are greater in magnitude than annual fluxes from, um, from mid-sized rivers, um, and then also greater in magnitude than the average silica flux for, um, from rivers from the North American continent. So per unit basin area, these changes that we're seeing in these headwater streams seem to be greater um, than these baseline fluxes. And, and just a, you know, reiterating the importance of um, sort of these high slope watersheds that are um, you know, draining mountainous areas or silica geology having a really important role in the silica, uh, silica um, exports. And so these were equivalent to adding or removing an entire river if we think about the magnitude of change that occurred over this period of record. Um, so when during the shifts year are these shifts occurring? Um, so we're also able to pull out sort of monthly data um, from, um, from these model outputs. So we were able to evaluate trends by month for each of these sites. Um, so you can see, you know, silica generally has this kind of seasonal pattern, um, can decline highest in the winter, declines into May, and then increases again throughout the year, at least in temperate systems. Um, so we wanted to see across all these different types of sites, when during the year were these, these changes occurring? And not, not all of our sites have the same 
seasonality. So we, we did this by month. Um, so just to give you one example of what that looks like, um, this is a site I'm familiar with, the Black River, um, which is in Wisconsin. It's a temperate forest uh, site that drains directly into the Mississippi River. I um, mean, at this site, we saw, you know, the sort of slightly increasing trend. Um, the, the points are observed concentrations are estimated by the model, and then this is the flow normalized value. So we're seeing this sort of long-term increase um, in concentration and flux at this site. So we wanted to know, you know, what during what portion of the year is this really um, occurring. And when you divide this trend by month, each line is a different month during the year, as shown by their different color. Um, it seems that this trend is really being driven by increases that are happening uh, during the winter months. Um, so December through February, those top lines, um, and then, you know, midsummer to fall or the middle there, where we're kind of seeing a stable, stable trend. Um, and then the uh, sort of late spring, early summer, April through June are those green lines there at the bottom. Um, so you, you know, we're seeing the increases in the winter, no change in the sort of summer fall and maybe even some declines in that early spring or late spring period. Um, so you know, to try to understand you know, why, why are we seeing these um, increases during the winter, um, in this river in particular and several in this area, we also see this for nitrate. Um, and so you know, when, you, when you sort of turn off terrestrial and river productivity, um, there's no uptake of uh, nitrate and, and uh, silica. Um, so whatever, um, we think that this reflects a sort of a groundwater, potentially could reflect a groundwater signal. So whatever silica has accumulated in the groundwater over the course of the, the season, um, that then is then flushed into the river and you see um, this um, increasing trend through time, which maybe could be a function of um, some increased weathering rates that are occurring that then um, accumulate uh, silica in the groundwater. I um, mean, this has implications in terms of sort of what that seasonal trend looks like. So um, you can, this is now lines by year um, over the period of record for this site. You can see really in these later years that are red and purple, we see high concentrations in the winter. Um, and, and then kind of relatively similar over the period of record, um, except for these sort of middle years. Um, but the one implication of this is that, you know, we have these high, higher concentrations in the winter, but they're get, getting drawn down to about the same level as they were in the past. Um, so this sort of the increasing magnitude of this seasonal shift could have some important implications for river productivity, that, you know, sort of diatom productivity in the river. Um, and then to scale out to the rest of our sites, um, besides just the Black River, um, some take homes from this. What I'm showing you is sort of by month um, in these different biomes. And then each of these box, boxes represent um, the distribution of the trends for each of the rivers at those um, within those LTERs or um, biome types. So the distribution of their trend through time for each of those months. Um, so one thing to point out is that you know, trends are not uniform across the year for all of these different systems. Um, maybe they're more uniform um, at the coniferous forest sites, um, at H.J. Andrews. Um, there seems to be highly variable at the Lupio sites. Um, but then when you think about the alpine sites or um, these Arctic rivers, um, you know, in the Arctic, in the Alpine, we're seeing sort of increases in the spring and fall um, versus the Arctic. Um, the decline seemed to be greatest during um, during the summer months, um, which suggests that it could be, um, you know, an uptake signal either on the terrestrial landscape or um, within the river itself. Um, so in general, um, they're not uniform across the year. Um, often the larger shifts are occurring outside the traditional growing season months. So a lot of dynamic stuff happening, you know, winter, spring, um, you know, and, and fall. Um, and so this, you know, looking more into these types of trends can give us some hints at the mechanisms that are driving those, those long-term trends across, um, across our, our, these biomes. So finally, that ends me with, um, you know, what are driving these changes? And I, I think I probably convinced you that there's a lot of variability um, and, you know, not things are not necessarily meeting our expectations of um, what we expected. Um, so um, what I want to do here is just give you a sense of kind of how we're, we're trying to get at, you know, are there sort of overarching themes or um, ways to think about how, uh, what's driving the changes in silica across these different biomes. Um, so um, I'll walk you through different, couple of different analyses um, and then um, uh, a couple um, stories where we have, we feel like we might have a better chance of understanding what the, the mechanisms are. 
Um, and so just, I'll do this quickly, but just to remind you in terms of what drives increases and decreases, you know, we, get, we have geological signals from weathering and changing flow paths. We have hydrologic signals from changes in residence time, um, changes in discharge that can drive um, um, silica up or down. Um, and then we also have changes in the landscape. So changes in terrestrial productivity as well as in river productivity. Um, and so, and, and several other factors in terms of uh, water resource management and agriculture that can, can also interact with a lot of these drivers. So the first one um, to, we looked at was, you know, can we get a sense of how much, what the role of changing hydrology is versus the role of changing flow paths across these different sites. Um, and we used a modified version of this WRTDS model to evaluate the relative role of changes in discharge over the period of record, so has discharge increased or decreased, versus a change in the concentration discharge relationship. Um, so has, you know, the, uh, uh, how much uh, silica is being exported at a different uh, discharge change through time. Um, so we're seeing dilution or, or flushing relationships over time. Um, and then I'll step through a couple of stories from uh, long, re long term research sites um, and then show you kind of where we are with trying to pull this all together. Um, and, and in this case, we're using a sort of multivariate regression approach or redundancy analysis to get at some of those drivers. Um, so thinking about the relative role of discharge versus changing concentration discharge relationships, um, and this is from um, the three alpine sites that we have, um, and these are along a, a, a elevation gradient here. Um, so we have the Albion, which is low elevation, Martinelli, um, which is mid elevation, and then a saddle stream, which is high elevation. And what this is showing is, you know, the total percent change in concentration in the black um, the percent of that change that's driven by a change in discharge over the period of record, and then the percent of that change that's driven by a concentration, a, a shift in the concentration discharge relationship. The, the beauty of this model is that you estimate that at a daily scale, so you can then sort of attribute that to the, to the change through time. Um, and, and in all three of these cases, um, a shift in the concentration discharge relationship really seems to um, drive this change, so which goes along with what we hypothesize about how this how these sites are changing in terms of increased weathering rates um, and you know, sort of more substantial uh, release of silica from, um, from the rocks uh, as glaciers melt and temperatures warm through time. Interestingly, um, in these cases, um, discharge was acting in the opposite direction. So you saw that um, just the, uh, a change in discharge actually um, was responsible for bringing that concentration down. So sort of negative proportion of that trend. And so the ultimate um, percent change was sort of a balance between how discharge was changing and then how this concentration discharge relationship was changing through time. And across all these R sites, um, this was generally, this was a, a pretty strong pattern. So a lot of these streams were showing that more of the change in the trend was a shift in the CQ relationship rather than um, a change in discharge. So whether discharge was increasing or decreasing through time. It was more of a function of the fact that the relationship of concentration and discharge was changing. And interestingly, uh, we need to look more into it, but a lot of times the concentration discharge relationship and discharge relationship were trending in different directions. So explaining different, you know, sort of acting in um, opposite directions on the trend. So it really seems, you know, we, we're looking at these flow normalized fluxes, which help us to identify what's happening on the landscape. Um, but it really does seem that the, you know, concentration is changing. What's what's driving these changes in concentration that are related to flux, um, and seem so important through time. Um, and so one story I'll just walk through where we feel like we might have a little bit of better idea um, of what are what's driving changes at this site um, is the Upper Mississippi River system. Um, so this is a large river basin that spans about eight orders eight units of uh, latitude from Minnesota down to um, Missouri. Um, and so it, it crosses really interesting gradients in terms of uh, land cover and uh, nutrient content, suspended solids in this river, um, river productivity, um, but also has a pretty substantial shift from silica geology in the north um, to not so uh, to uh, not silica geology in the south. Um, and that was really reflected in these differences in the direction of the trend. So in uh, the northern sites, we're seeing increasing as well as in the Illinois River. Um, and then these decreases in these further south sites. So down here in Missouri, as well as um, right around here around St. Louis. And when looking across 
um, all these different types of drivers, you know, uh, trophic status, suspended sediment, sediments, land cover. Um, the thing that seems to pop out is really the watershed lithology. So um, sites that had um, silicate geology were showing an increase over time, suggesting that sort of, you know, even though all of these sites are experiencing an increase in air temperature, um, really only the sites with the silicate geology have a source um, to then export into the river. And we're seeing, you know, de declines over time in these southern sites. Um, you know, what is driving that trend um, merits more investigation. Um, and then just one, you know, in terms of thinking about, we have one site that has a particularly long record, so we can, we have the ability to sort of look over a longer time scale um, at this Hubbard Brook site, uh, site. we have um, eight watersheds that we were able to look at um, that have been monitored from you know, the mid 60s and to, um, to, to today. Um, and these data have been synthesized um, previously um, by Conley um, and just really, his work really emphasized the importance of this management history in um, showing uh, you know, silica fluxes in rivers. Um, so they, you know, they, these watersheds were treated differently in terms of a clear cut versus strip cutting and whole tree harvest. And you can see that those three types of treatments um, affected silica fluxes differently. Um, and that, but reference sites had a fairly similar um, trajectory over the course of that period. However, we have 20 more years of data um, now, so we wanted to include that additional data. Um, and surprisingly, now it seems like everything is doing something similar. So no matter what its management history, we're seeing sort of this uniform increase um, since the mid 2000s up to today. Um, so this, you know, could be a function of, we don't really know, but um, other studies have shown that there's the rate of per to terrestrial productivity at Hubbard Brook has decreased, um, so there could potentially be less uptake by the terrestrial system and more river export, uh, higher concentrations. Um, and we also have seen, you know, continuous air temperature increases over the course of this record, um, and the increases we're seeing um, in the silica really overlie with uh, maybe a potentially um, greater increase in that air temperature. So maybe um, it's, it's an increased weathering signal. And I'm running out of time, um, but you know, this we're, we're trying to bring this all together in terms of you know, where are we seeing the biggest change? What's driving that change? Um, and I, you know, I think one of the couple of the main messages is we're struggling <laughs> to, to do that, um, but we're, we're getting a better sense as we kind of dig into these different sites. Um, but the major overlying um, finding that we're seeing is really these high latitude sites, so whether they're in the Arctic or in the Antarctic are really seeing the most magnitude change. Um, and then also um, in terms of decreasing concentrations uh, and then increasing concentrations at these alpine sites where we have these really large snowpacks um, and sort of changing glacial dynamics. Um, and it appears um, we have the drivers for concentration are um, perhaps distinct from the drivers in flux um, because they're falling on different axes here. So um, things uh, in terms of the flux itself, it's really highly correlated with discharge. But when you think of that in a full normalized sense, there's a whole range of drivers um, of that flux. Um, so to wrap it up, um, I hope we've convinced you that silica is changing. Um, it's happening in really complex ways um, across biomes and then even within biomes. Um, considering the phenology of that change, as well as the shifts in, in concentration discharge behavior are helping us to elicit some of those mechanisms and really showing that, you know, um, the climate change is impacting um, these sites in, in a pretty big way. Um, but I think it's, as you can see, it's difficult to predict in a simple way how silica might change into the future given the broad scale controls across the terrestrial aquatic continuum. So a couple of challenges that we're, uh, you know, we face in terms of limited number of sites within biomes, we can't cross all the interesting gradients that we want to. So just an invitation to, you know, we hope to keep this database growing. So if there are, you know, data sets we're not aware of, we would love to, to integrate those to help, you know, fulfill our uh, fill out our understanding, um, and then obtaining and generating sort of necessary data across all those scales, soils, lithology, and land cover. So a lot of opportunities to fill in gaps with data from other networks. Um, and then we had the wonderful opportunity to work with um, other synthesis groups um, to sort of generate climate and hydrological information that um, could inform some of these um, trends. 
Uh, and finally, um, just a huge thank you to probably many of you that are listening um, for collecting, analyzing, and managing this data. Uh, it's a huge effort to keep these types of data collection efforts going over this amount of time. And I think you can just see we're, we're learning a lot as a result of all those efforts. Um, and so, and then just to the rest of our Silica working group, it's been a wonderful um, opportunity. So I think we have some time for questions. We do. Thank you so much. I'm sure the um, there's tons of clapping going on um, from all of those muted attendees, but I, for one, will, will add my clapping. Um, really nice presentation. We do actually have some questions that came in already, so for now, I'll just I'll read them in order. Um, Jim Clorn, I hope I um, pronounced that correctly, asks, okay, one, are the data published? And then two, is there a forward-looking component of this research? Um, well, uh, so the data are not, well, we actually, so a lot of the data that we're relying on are published data sets. So, you know, majority of the LTERs that we're showing, those are all public data sets. Um, the USGS, Upper Mississippi River, all like, I think almost everything we've included is already public data. Um, so it, in terms of our, um, our data set that we pulled together, that's not yet published, but um, will be when we, you know, publish the, the manuscript. Um, and I think, yeah, in terms of forward looking, I think I, I'll let Joe look at this too, but um, I mean, I think our ultimate hope is to get a better understanding of how climate change might affect um, silica exports and concentrations. Um, and so I think, you know, sort of working our way toward coming up with reasons for change so that we could then try to forecast that into the future. Yeah, great, thanks. Um, the second question in, the um, Q and A is from John Kamenowski, and John asks, "Do you know how silica flux rates are changing relative to nitrogen rates in these different systems? Might we expect regional changes in um, siliceous phytoplankton abundance as a result?" And you, Joe and Kathy, Joe, you can read these as well um, if it's easier to take it in that way. Um, well, John, I, I guess I'll just say. You, uh, I think one of our next, we actually ran all these same models on um, for nitrogen and phosphorus. Um, so I, we do know those, um, those values. We have not yet synthesized sort of how nitrogen is changing relative to silica, um, but it's a really important question. I think we decided to tackle the silica part of that first before nitrogen. Go ahead, Joanna. I was gonna say the same exact thing. It was still, fairly preliminary, I would say, our results, but that is definitely one of our questions is looking at the ratios of the exports and how those have changed for sure. Yeah. Great. Um, and there's sort of two related questions, one from Diane McKnight in the Q&A and one from Todd Royer in the chat, but Diane um, notes that the federal government has just announced a $50 billion um, effort to mitigate wildfire through increased management efforts in the Sierras and the Rockies. How might this affect the silica export from headwaters in these mountainous regions in addition to climate change? And there's another question as well about um, wildfire in the chat. Let's see if it's the same question. What's known about the short-term and longer-term effects of wildfire on silica fluxes? It seems wildfire could be an important indirect pathway by which climate change affects silica fluxes. So related questions generally What's going on with wildfire and and especially in the Sierras and Rocky Mountains with different management of wildfires? That's a really good question. So the, the issue of wildfire uh, and how that influences silica fluxes has received very little attention. In fact, uh, it, the only paper I know of is actually one that I wrote uh, looking at a, a wildfire in uh, tundra, the large the Anatovic River fire in the in the Arctic in Alaska. Uh, and that showed that we actually saw no differences in stream exports between burned and unburned landscape, but the vegetation in the recovered watershed had almost double the amount of silica as the unburned vegetation. So it seemed like there was this more silica available after the fire and the plants were taking it up and we didn't see the signal in the exports. And that's just one study that is, the only study that I'm aware of, but if there are others, I'd love to know about them. So please do share. But it's yeah. a really great research question that we're interested in for sure. 
yeah, feel free to use the chat if anybody out there knows of other yeah. Um, yeah. other studies or papers. Um, that'd be great. A lot of what we want to do here is, is connect people. And, mm -hmm. and people, so. um, okay, so now changing from fire to snow, Carrie Bowering asks, could changing snowpack dynamics contribute to or explain the greater silica changes during winter in the temperate forests, as well as those increasing trends that observed in both the reference and clear cut sites over the past 20 years at Hubbard Brook? I'm thinking about that. That's a good question too. So to my knowledge, no one has looked at that specifically. And so I don't think there's any papers on that. Although I do know that um, Pam Templer has a study at Hubbard Brook and, and uh, myself and a couple of others are working on actually looking at that question of changing snowpack and how that influences forest silica dynamics at Hubbard Brook, but that's a long ways off. But in terms of snowpack changes, yes, I think that would influence the flux, not only because of the changes in hydrology, you know, runoff timing, uh, that type of thing, but also uh, soil temperatures. Uh, change when snowpack changes. So, and infiltration rates would change with that. So I think, um, I think it's a great question and there's probably some signal of snowpack here to untangle, yeah. Yeah, great, okay. Um, and Thank another you. question coming in, um, there are many flood control dams in the upper Mississippi. Do you think the management of discharge of the dams um, impact the DSI exports? That's a good question. Um, so in terms of the main stem itself, a lot of those, um, you know, they're designed like navigation focused dams. So they don't have the same, you know, their reservoirs don't have the same type of residence time that we would think about for, you know, hydropower dams, you know, but within the watershed, there's you know, a broader array of, of flood control dams. Um, and, you know, a different paper that we did um, sort of think looking at us, uh, looking across the Upper Miss showed that you know residence time was an important factor, both in these sort of, even though the impounded areas are not, don't have as high of residence time as a flood control dam might, you know, those and then as in backwater lakes, um, they show different stoichiometry and lower concentrations of silica um, than the flowing channel areas. So really showed that, you know, there is an effect of residence time in a in the complicated system in the in the upper Mississippi River. Um, um, uh, that that signal would be integrated, you know, sort of over over these. You know, we were looking only at main channel, um, main channel ones here, so that we integrate that signal. I don't know if you have something else to say there, Joanna. No, you said what I was thinking. Okay. <laughs> Great. And. Um... Finally, um, Daniel Conley asks, uh, first off, great talk and interesting project. Um, I especially like the update from Hubbard Brook. Question one, in rivers from Sweden and Finland, we find silica flux rates are strongly influenced by the number of lakes in the watershed. Have you looked at that factor? And then there's a second question coming as well. You could take that one if you want. So, Exactly. Uh, so in terms of your question, it's a great point. So we have not included in that PCA that Kathy Jo showed land cover, including, uh, you know, amount of standing water or lakes or wetlands in the watersheds is not included in that. So that PCA doesn't include land cover, which, and it also doesn't include lithology. So we haven't, we don't have land cover data yet on all of these basins, which is why it's not in the PCA. But that's an excellent point that we have thought about and definitely need to look at further for sure. And then you also bring up an excellent point about the fact that we're looking at just one fraction of the silica here. We're looking at just the dissolved fraction and ignoring the biogenic, uh, lithogenic, for example. So we have thought about uh, particles. We have not analyzed, we have some TSS data, which we have not. Uh, looked at yet in conjunction with the DSI. And our records of biogenic silica, as you are probably not surprised, is not great. So we'd love data on the biogenic silica um, if, to, to look at that as well. We haven't gotten there yet. So we have focused just so far on the DSI, but it, you, you raise really good questions about other things to think about for sure. I just say, you know, um, in the 
in these lower sites in the upper mess as well as in the Arctic rivers, those have seen declines in um, suspended solids um, over the, the same period of record. So there could be, yeah, there, there sounds like there could be a link there in terms of. That's a good point. Yeah, the at AGU, Jim McClellan talked about the declining TSS at these Arctic in these Arctic big rivers that kind of correlated with the declines in silica, right? Yeah, interesting. Um, okay, and um, Dan Thornhill gets in a, a last question as we're a little bit over time. That's okay. We 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 can stay on. Um, I'm curious to hear a bit about how this collaboration came together and how it was supported. Was was this primarily through the LNO synthesis group support, or did you get support from other sources? Well, it came together because Kathy, Joe, and I did our postdocs at the same institution. Uh, the Marine Biological Lab. And so we <coughs> ran into each other in the hallway and became friends and started just talking about our research interests and they overlapped. And, and the, so we just chatted about this for years and then we saw the funding call and wrote the proposal. So that's how it came together. And it's supported through the LNO synthesis. Uh, we obtain our salaries from other sources, of course, but this project is funded through this LNO synthesis. Yeah. And I would just say a lot of generous time um, by the people in our working group yes. donating their time to being involved in this. Um, so yeah, we were lucky to get all the people in our group um, to participate. So yeah, definitely. Very collaborative, the mm -hmm. whole working group. That's fantastic to hear. We're, we're excited to hear that as well too. And um, I love that you just chatted in the hallway and I can't wait till we can spin up more work by hallway chats, but until then, yeah, and your group's done excellent work through trying times, you know, it's hard to do a synthesis group when, when most of the interactions are virtual. So I'm, I'm just yeah. super impressed and really happy that you came in and spoke with everybody today. We really appreciate your time, um, as do I'm sure all the attendees. So I, th I think we'll wrap it up there. I don't see any other questions. Um, Marty, do you have any can other I, Can I just or? chime in with one, uh, Dan set the stage for this perfectly. Um, we do expect there to be a new call for synthesis proposals. It'll come out later this spring. It'll be due uh, probably late September. Mm -hmm. uh, and we are. We have recently been able to ramp up the support for synthesis working groups uh, to include not just travel support, which was sort of how they originally started, a chance to get together, uh, but also uh, some postdoc and data analyst support. Um, so we're really excited about that. And we're looking forward to seeing a ton of interesting new proposals uh, this fall and we hope this uh this talk provides some inspiration for what kinds of things you could do thanks and thank Great. you everybody thank you. for coming yeah and kathy joe and joe you can look at the chat people are are writing thank you and good work and virtually clapping as are we so so thanks thank everybody you. for attending please um we do this monthly um and most of you can um, have signed up for the whole series and we look forward to seeing you in a, a month from now. Thank Thanks you everyone for coming. Yeah, thank you.